I want to welcome everybody to the Midwest Future Forum. This is brought to you by the City of Williston. I'm Sean Wenko, the Executive Director of the Williston Economic Development Office. This is kind of a new thing that you'll see coming out of Williston Economic Development is, is what we're seeing with economic development today is, is kind of a move into more future looking things. And, and, you know, when I talk about future looking, one of the things that really seems to pop up, pop up a lot and we're getting a lot of questions on is, is the world of cryptocurrency in Bitcoin mining or, or data mining. And so we really wanted to get in depth a little bit and talk a bit about what it is, what are some of the economic developments uh, that we could see in Western North Dakota or the state as a whole? And, and what does the future look like? And what are some of the opportunities we can capitalize on this? I've got a great panel with us today, uh, a very, very professional educated panel with us today that has some great history uh, with the topic that we're talking about. Uh, first, I'll introduce, he's James Lamont. He's our Commerce Commissioner for the state of North Dakota. I also have Matt Marshall. He's Economic Development Administrator. He's with Minn Kota Power Cooperative. We have Max Junt. He is the founder of Chowcoin. And finally, Zach Keenan. He is the co-founder of Sundog Mining. So I wanna welcome all of you to today's Future Forum when we talk about cryptocurrency. To open it up, I want to give you guys the floor first. James, let's start with you, a little bit of your background and and uh, in the state of North Dakota and maybe some of the things you're seeing with this exciting new venture. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thanks for having me, Sean, and it's a pleasure to be part of the panel. <clears throat> James Lamont, Commerce Commissioner for the state of North Dakota. Um, what we're seeing in this trend, if you will, is a, a movement toward uh, the utilization of natural gas as well as low, low price energy, even if it's not natural gas, um, with respect to cryptocurrency mining, um, in addition to blockchain. And <clears throat> this is a direct result of inexpensive power generation, access to virtually free gas, and new technologies that have been developed with respect to leveraging net gas into a power source. A good example would be some of the trailers that um, Siemens technology has developed in response to this particular need. Um, Add the fact that some countries such as China, uh, which is obviously the largest country in the world, uh, population wise, uh, have banned cryptocurrency mining. So as a result, you're seeing pretty much a massive exodus of um, miners as well as those that invest in mining into North America and other suitable places. Given that we have a very firm rule of law as well as the infrastructure to handle not only the power but also the bandwidth requirements this is why you're seeing growth in this particular industry, um, primarily in the western part of the state. Thanks, James. And with that, you know, I'm going to jump over to you, Matt, because uh, we're going to talk again and talk a little bit with power in, in your field of expertise. You know, we started seeing a lot of calls come into the Economic Development Office. And, and when we talk about uh, data mining or Bitcoin mining, um, they always want to know what the cost of power is. So obviously that's a big, big component when we talk about the development of this. A um, little bit of background about yourself and then what are you seeing on the power side of things? Yeah, thanks, John. I really appreciate it. My name is Matt Marshall. I'm the economic developer here for Minn Kota Power. And uh, my experience primarily with cryptocurrency mining and you know the blockchain technologies is that um, you know, we've established several relationships and within our system have several operators, Zach being one of them, um, operating currently. And so you're absolutely right. There's a lot of power considerations that go into the site, um, citing these facilities specifically. So everything from reliability um, and then just the availability of, of low cost power. And so, uh, you know, we have to compete. Uh, globally for some of these um, uh, operators to come up here. Um, and so, you know, generally speaking, you're going to have to have a way um, to compete from an energy pricing standpoint with, um, you know, the, the low price natural gas on the Western side of the state or even places um, like Russia or Iran, because these operators are looking worldwide. Um, and he, we're, you know, blessed in North Dakota, we, we have uh, low cost, uh, reliable um, power. And so in the last six months, uh, because of some of the work that have, has been done by the state, and then the utilities across the state were uh, a, a great 
uh, location for a lot of these operators to be looking. Excellent. Thanks, Matt. Jumping over to the entrepreneurs a bit. And again, as we explained, you're, you're really talking about two parts uh, today. We're talking about the, the, the currency aspect, the, the cryptocurrency aspect, but you're also talking about the, the mining and what I mentioned about a ledger in the database. But I'm going to go to you first, Max, as a founder of Chowcoin. Um, tell me a little bit about what Chowcoin is and what it does. So, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Max John, founder of Chowcoin. Chowcoin is for restaurants that are tired of paying the 2 to 6% credit card interchange fees. And we can use a blockchain solution that drastically lowers the transaction costs. And we are, compared to the credit card companies, we're way cheaper. And compared to other blockchain payment solutions, we try to be much more user-friendly and a whole product for restaurants. So we have analytics. And why we like blockchain is because currently payments are way cheaper than they need to be or they're, they're way cheaper than they currently are. And so the example I use is there's an exchange protocol out there called Zero X, and they did 10,000 transactions with $42 million worth of transactional volume, and the fees for that were $25. So if you take a normal 3% exchange fee that say a restaurant would pay, that, would, that $42 million would cost 1.26 million, and they only took $25 worth of fees. So that's a 99.9% .9 reduction. And we just want to bring those savings to the average consumer in the average restaurant. Excellent. Thanks, Max. Now, when you talk about, you know, again, there's transactions, there's got to be a ledger. I'm going to jump to you, Zach. Um, tell me a bit about your company, because I think that's what you guys are doing, uh, that you're in that realm when we're talking about the mining of the data and, and, and the ledger itself. Yep, that's correct. So I'm Zachary Keenan, and thanks, Sean, for having me. I'm co-founder of Sundog Mining. We're a cryptocurrency uh, co-location and management company primarily. We have uh, over 20 megawatts managed right now in North Dakota with one site under construction and a few more ago. Uh, but what we do is we manage the machines that are actually doing the processing on the blockchain. So we make sure that they're running correctly, sending the correct transactions, taking the correct fee that they should be, uh, things like that. Thanks, Zach. Jumping back to you, James, a little bit, you know, you look at, you guys are doing, you know, some tremendous things with the state of North Dakota, you know, really looking uh, with a forward look uh, to what the future of, of really economic development is. You know, what are you seeing? I mean, this thing is really ramping up and you see investors wanting to get into this. And is this just a flash in the pan or is it something we really should as developers invest uh, going forward on this? Well, that's an excellent question, Sean. And, um, you know, I don't know, even if some of the most sophisticated, sophisticated um, analysts on Wall Street have an answer for that. Um, I've seen everything from Taibi indicate that this thing's going to zero to those like Lee, uh, who believe that um, this is the future of payments, not just uh, Bitcoin mining or cryptocurrency mining, but just the sort of the broader path forward with respect to how all transactions take place, uh, even if it's a transaction uh, involving something that doesn't involve monetary exchange. So it's, it's really difficult to ascertain, given that, um, you know, currencies have 5,000 years worth of history associated with them, whereas, and that meaning money, uh, whereas your cryptocurrencies are, you know, 12 years old uh, at, at, at their oldest, you know, so it's, it's really, it's really difficult to tell. Um, you know, some people believe that cryptocurrencies may be sort of the, the next generation gold and silver that augment um, cash and or electronic transactions, whereas others, I, it's, it's difficult. So uh, do I think it's going to be around for the next generation or two? Absolutely. Um, there are many uses to cryptocurrencies beyond just the exchange of dollars, as I said, um, from, from a bartering perspective, if you will, as well as um, other sort of utilizations uh, associated with identity preservation, with an ag, et cetera, just on using the same underlying technology. So it's, it's really difficult to say. One thing I can tell you though, is the currency, cryptocurrency market, the way it stands today uh, is very power or energy hungry. Uh, several years ago, I think it was three or four years ago, cryptocurrency mining eclipsed the entire consumption of the country of Hungary for perspective. You know, we're talking about tens of millions of people that have Western standards of living and use tremendous amounts of energy, yet 
the mining associated with cryptocurrency. And this is before the big boom, even the last several years. Uh, it was already exceeding that of Hungary. So, you know, the 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 opportunities are endless uh, as far as whether or not we should be investing in it. Yeah, I mean, if you're looking at it from a generational approach, sure. If you're looking at it from the next 50 to 100 years, I, I don't know. Um, so it's kind of a mixed bag in terms of, you know, each community, each um, commercial power provider, residential counter or, um, or industrial power provider, et cetera. Um, it, it's fascinating, though, I have to admit, I, you, you don't see these kind of booms come along very quickly, especially in something that's trying to upend, like I said, 5,000 years of transaction history associated with um, physical currencies. You know, the big question I get, again, I go back, you know, we did we did a, a rather large uh, PACE loan. And when I talk about PACE, it's a partnership with Bank of North Dakota. We help buy down the interest rate for a company that kind of gives them a lower cost in the front end for their operating costs. But we, we did a rather large PACE loan, um, you know, with the com- with a company out here and, and they do um, they do the data mining. A lot of questions I get from, you know, what are the economic development benefits of it? Is it a job creator? Where I saw was a benefit for us in Western North Dakota was they're actually utilizing a byproduct of the oil and gas industry. So they're finding a way to take the natural gas, convert that into power, uh, run these these data miners, and then you know also they're with excess power coming back and running the well pad itself. Uh, so to me, it's a win win because you know our number one industry in the West um, it helps it helps reduce costs, increase efficiencies help them operate at a lower break-even point. And again, you're taking a bike product that would normally be piped out or flared for the most part, and you're finding a utilization for it. And that's and it's pretty important right now in this whole, in, in the green movement that you're seeing um, with carbon capture. So that works well for us. But I want to throw it out. I mean, I don't see these things as big job creators. Am, am I right or wrong? I mean, where is the economic benefit uh, to to this, this, this new activity? Sean, I, I think you... You captured it really well. Um, the biggest economic benefit is as the state or oil producers, <coughs> natural gas producers, et cetera, are looking to achieve carbon neutrality targets to become more attractive to institutional investors. What they find is the less gas they flare and the more carbon capture that occurs, uh, the lower the risk for an investor, thereby lowering the um, the interest rates or um, if you're if you're tracking um, federal loans, for example, moving forward, you know, there's a high probability that their ESG ratings will will include um, rather their interest rates will include uh, an ESG rating to be part of that criteria. Or if you're buying insurance in your company, same thing. So at the end of the day, um, everything you just mentioned, plus it's driving value for the left side of the ledger for our oil and gas producers. I think Matt may be able to answer it as well from a, a you know a less um, oil and gas per, you know focused perspective. But at least on your side of the state, um, it, it does lower the cost of money for access in a very capital intensive industry, as well as the costs associated with the uh, kind of insurance and or borrowing they have to do. So I would I would ask Matt to weigh in too. Yeah, thanks, James. I really appreciate that. Um, I would agree. I think the economic value depends on where they locate. Uh, so I would ask people who are looking at this to, to look to a couple of examples of where it really can help a local economy. One, you absolutely will drive jobs. And when I'm done talking, I'll, I'll talk to or have Zach comment on how fast they've scaled up and all the positions they've added in a short amount of time. And these are, these are upskill positions where you can bring people in at entry level, upskill them, and now all of a sudden they have a marketable skill that they can go out um, and, and market to other, other positions they have or earn more money within the businesses that they operate. But you know, these operations are capital intensive. And what we're seeing is that, number one, uh, they're generating sales uh, um, property taxes um, through the additional infrastructure that's required to put in, um, depending on you know where their energy is coming from. Sometimes there's a local franchise fee component that adds a lot of value to a community. Uh, the other thing is they're incredibly flexible about where they locate. And so uh, though they're adding new jobs, um, they could locate out in sort of a rural area might be a great fit for um, some community that has some, you know, 
infrastructure assets available. And now all of a sudden you're seeing this capital intensive industry show up and they're hiring your local contractors to prep sites. And they're, they're contracting long-term um, with people uh, locally and it's this new revenue generator. And so it's been a, uh, I don't wanna say a boon locally, but when you ask our contractors, the size of the contracts and the scale that they're seeing, um, there's a huge economic value from that standpoint. And so I think a lot of us in economic development originally approached it and said, you know, there's not going to be an enormous amount of jobs when you look at the CapEx investment versus what we see in like a manufacturing plant, for example. And, and because we were, we, you know, we as economic developers are so used to seeing the jobs and the CapEx investment sort of scale together, we kind of thought, well, you know, maybe it'll be a little less. I'm happy to report that, you know, as we have a history with this, uh, you're seeing a lot of that CapEx stay right in the communities that they're landing and get spread around. And there are jobs that are scaling up rather quickly. And so with that, I'd love Zach to talk about how fast, um, you know, <laughs> they scaled in a short amount of time and the employees that they found and where they think they're going. Yeah, thanks, Matt. So at the, we were contracted to operate uh, this one site that's pretty large sites, most of what we do. Uh, so we went from having just myself and the other owner to 14 employees in the matter of two weeks, 10 full-time, four part-time. And we're still looking for two more full-time and two more part-time just for this one site alone. Um, and like Matt said, you know, you don't, it's, we train you up. So you don't need any skills when you come in. And depending on what we need, what we already have, uh, some people will train to do soldering to fix the machines, the boards themselves. Some will send to networking classes so they can get Cisco certified. Uh, so even if they decide to go on to a different uh, industry besides crypto, they'll have skills that we train them for. So Max, I mean, you're ready to launch in a couple of, of restaurants in Williston right now. And that's one thing we're seeing with Williston is you know, we have, we have a, a new finance director that took the helm, um, you know, about, about two years ago now. Um, you know, he's been very progressive in his thinking, you know, Williston is one of the first cities in the state that you can now uh, accept uh, cryptocurrency for payment uh, for your utility bill. And then there also, you'll see now at our new XWA International Airport is a, is a Bitcoin ATM. You know, it's kind of one of those things that will it get used a lot? I don't know. Uh, it, it's going to be rather new, but you know, again, it's just one of those things. It's just uh, they're starting to just show up everywhere, um, and the word cryptocurrency is just starting to show up in, in everything you do. But I'm going to jump again to you, Max. We talk about you're ready to launch in these restaurants. How has the restaurant industry have they been receptive to what you to what your company is and what you're trying to do? Yeah, absolutely. So part of the reason we chose restaurants is that. I've been working with restaurants since 2014. I actually worked in the kitchens in a restaurant in uh, Williston. But restaurants themselves, it's a hard business. They have very thin margins. And so if we're able to save them 3%, that's a huge boost to their profits that they wouldn't normally have. So they are incredibly receptive to any kind of offer that we can have for them. And they're constantly shopping around for cheaper credit card transactions anyway. So they're, they're constantly looking. And one of the things we like about Williston is that, in our view, the hardest part about cryptocurrencies for the average person is actually using them. It, the, like the UIs are not very friendly right now. Just the the space in general is not, I think it's right on the cusp of being accepted more broadly because it's still kind of hard to use now and get into. And with Williston letting people pay bills with it, I think that's a huge first step. I, I think for cryptocurrency to have larger adoption, you need actual use cases for it. And so Williston is already accepting of a use case. We're providing another. And I think that's really going to drive the ball forward and help people along to adopt well, so when you talk about the use case, I, I couldn't agree with you more because, you know, James, uh, you had mentioned that, you know, we have 5,000 years of history of actual, you know, currency behind us, that it, it's going to be a hard transition uh, for people to get behind something that you can't, you know, that you can't feel uh, and, and have in your hands. And, and the more that, you know, people start to adopt it, the more use you're going to see. You've mentioned, Max, the, the benefit that the proprietor sees. Is there a benefit benefit to the user? I mean, some of those lower costs are they passed on to them as well, or, or what? What would motivate the user to want to use Chowcoin? So that's something we're working on uh, restaurant to restaurant right now. And so one thing we're trying initially is at bars to do a Chowcoin happy hour. So 
they only get the happy hour if they purchase in Chowcoin. So the restaurant saves the transaction fees and then the, the customer also gets a benefit. But long term, we're thinking if we have a, a group of restaurants, if we're saving all of them anywhere between two and six percent, the ones that are saving a bit more, they have more room to pass on the savings to the consumer. And that's the ultimate goal, right, is you want the consumer to be able to save money. If it's a cheaper process in general, that should be able to get passed forward because in the end, we're all consumers anyway. So that's the ultimate benefit. Max, I have a quick question for you on, on Chow Coin. Hypothetically speaking, if I bought a bunch of Chow Coin and then suddenly Chow Coin rose in popularity, my value would also raise extremely high, kind of like um, the exchange rate with uh, the U.S. currency. Is that correct as well? Well, so right now we have our governance token out and we're actually creating a, so we're built on Ethereum and we're creating a stable coin that all the actual transactions in the app will be done in. So pegged to a U.S. dollar, so it will fluctuate hopefully between no more than a dollar and a penny and 99 cents. And so all the purchases for food will be done in the stable coin. So if you purchase ahead of time with that, uh, it won't drop in value. You won't, it won't gain in value. And the governance token will fluctuate, but that's, I, I, I can't predict that, but that won't actually affect your direct purchases. So from a consumer standpoint, our goal is actually kind of have it be so they never really see that they're purchasing in crypto at all. They just, the back end transactions are happening in crypto and saving everyone money. Awesome. James, I'm going to jump back to you. You know, again, we talk about, you know, with, uh, you know, your position as Commerce Commissioner for the state of North Dakota, you guys are working on some very big ticket items and, and you're thinking globally on, on what the future in North Dakota holds. Uh, again, when I say thinking globally, you know, you're out there trying to rec recruit kind of that, that, you know, that, that next future or next step and generation of uh, economic development for North Dakota. How important is it that that cryptocurrency has a presence in the state? And, and I guess where I'm going is, you know, when I'm talking to developers or entrepreneurs, um, is there, you know, is it important that we just continue to stay, you know, ahead of the game with these guys and continue to find ways to welcome them uh, into the state of North Dakota? Or, or again, or do you think something that it's, it's uh, you know, it's something that maybe will just take care of itself? Excellent question. Um, one of the biggest selling points we have right now for our energy sector is the fact that we will be the first carbon neutral state by 2030, even though we are the second largest hydrocarbon producer and we will continue to be the second largest hydrocarbon producer. Um, this is done through a variety of methods from utilizing the state as a carbon sink based on our geological formations, as well as access to carbon from our region to the fact that we could use that for throughput and enhanced oil recovery, capture that gas that's created and either liquefy it and sell it or add value to it, or even use it for EOR continuously. My point being, by being the first carbon neutral state in the country, we're able to attract the type of capital that other places simply aren't. Cryptocurrency mining, uh, as well as blockchain, uh, are a component of this. So every little bit helps, especially given sort of the disparate nature in terms of how our Bakken system deployed. Unlike the Permian, it's not nearly as centralized in terms of you know, the choreography associated with growth. And so as a result, these blockchain operations that pop up from point A to point C to point D to Z um, help us mitigate some of that gas flaring in other areas, right? So all of this is part of a broader method to become carbon neutral by 2030, while ensuring that we continue to grow our fossil fuels industry, as well as add value where we can. And this would be a perfect example of that value added production. So I'd say crypto, like any other technology, is um, providing, a, you know, an augmentation to this strategy uh, versus a, you know, neutral or negative net balance. Thanks, James. Jumping to you, Matt, though, talking about the future of, 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 let's say, the power grid. You know, you're seeing you're seeing cryptocurrency and you're seeing mining coming down the field. Is there is there going to be enough power out there? Or what needs to change um, with the power providers uh, moving forward? Yeah, I think just a strategic deployment of where they go. Um, there, there's a you know, there's currently room. Um, within the state to deploy several of these. And at some point you'll get to that situation where, you know, you're going to have to add, you know, generation resources, or maybe, you know, you make that decision that, you know, the state's got what they need. Um, but there's a lot of room right now um, within um, different areas of the state. And again, a lot of it boils down to the responsibility of the utility and the users. If they're deployed responsibly, 
um, and, and they work well with their utility, I mean, there's an incredible upside and very positive um, for uh, not only the state, but the, the world. Uh, you, long term, as we go forward, I, I see these um, operators helping stabilize systems, help bring on new generation resources and a diversity of different resources, um, and help bolster some of our historic resources as well, keep them viable, um, and then maybe see some growth there. James is doing a lot, um, a lot of leaderships coming out of the state about, you know, sort of that next generation. And it's sort of that rising tide um, uh, lifts all boats mentality. So without question, um, you know, I see this a, a very viable thing in the future and something that the state should be paying attention to and being as aggressive as we can. Jumping over to the entrepreneur, Zach, I'm going to let you have uh, go first here. But when you, when you look at uh, your operation, what is important to you from um, an economic development standpoint, or I should say from a, a state standpoint or the, or the region or respective area where you guys want to set up and deploy? What is important to you for your company? Uh, for us, one of the biggest things that we look at is just what, uh, you know, resources are around, you know. What does the local EEC have that they can help us out with? You know, is it site prep? Is it uh, help with jobs for paying part of those? Is it just communicating? You know, we, we try to look at these local resources and that's one of the biggest drivers for us where we pick our sites. We're trying to look at six different ones right now and it's where do we go? You know, do they have, uh, you know, grants that we can use to help get us going? Things like that. Perfect. Max, what's, what ensures your success when coming into the market here in North Dakota? Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's the communication and I guess openness that you guys have had to cryptocurrency. The fact that you're letting people pay their bills with it already introduces a familiarity that if we didn't have you, we'd have to kind of cultivate on our own. That would cost a lot more time on our end. So we're just glad to have that already established. All right. Well, guys, I want to give, I just want to open the floor for final word. Um, you know, just one last thought on when we talk cryptocurrency again, it's something that specifically, you know, for me and in, in Williston and, and, and the economic development offices, we're seeing a tremendous shift in, in economic development. We're, we're talking about cryptocurrency. Uh, you know, we'll talk in another futures forum. We're going to talk about a network called Vantis, which helps the UAS sector fly beyond visual line of sight. Uh, you know, we've even, even added it's, it's uh, you know, people may laugh in larger cities, but for a small smaller community like Williston. I mean, we even added, added the rideshare component uh, with scooters going around town and they've been tremendously successful. So again, I think that goes back to, you're looking at statewide, we're just a much younger, uh, we're a younger state. There's a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs that are looking at the state and, and looking at the opportunities there. But, you know, final thoughts when we're talking cri cryptocurrency, James, I'll, I'll give you the, the first uh, shot there. Yes, 5,000 years of currency history. Um, but I would argue the information technology age is, is just as young, right? So even though it's, it's unproven and it's kind of a newer concept, uh, if you think about how we were doing business 30 years ago uh, and how we transacted, I mean, just everything is so different. And seeing blockchain as well as other peer-to-peer -peer sort of accelerated networks help us accomplish what were once basic transactions to me, this is huge. And so I don't want it to be seen as a, a negative. Um, it's, it's a technological advancement. We don't know where it's going to go uh, with respect to the regulatory environment, nor how it's going to evolve into, um, you know, a balance of payment system. I think Max hit it on the head earlier when, when he mentioned there's likely going to be a consolidation in industry at some point um, based on all of these entities trying to find one solution for a problem using underlying um, blockchain tech, right? And so future's bright. It's a great area to help us solve some of our flaring challenges, especially given the disparate nature of, of how we um, develop our oil and gas. And um, I'm, I'm bullish on it. Matt? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sean. And I'm going to piggyback off of James' um, comments about, you know, first of all, being bullish and just remind people that we talked a lot about cryptocurrencies today, but above and beyond uh, cryptocurrency, this blockchain technology has already seen huge advancements and real practical uses, whether it's artificial intelligence, video rendering, and the facilities themselves. 
are now being considered as low cost data storage solutions that might compete with sort of the fully redundant data centers that you're seeing um, in other parts of the, the world and the country. And so, uh, you know, this conversation is, is, uh, is fascinating when you think about cryptocurrency, but there's also this entire technology behind it um, that is going to help drive it. And so like James, I'm bullish not only on the cryptocurrency, but just the technology that's driving it and how it's going to change our future as we move forward. Max. I, I'm also bullish. Earlier you asked if it was a fad or here to stay. And I think blockchain as a technology is like the internet. It's going to be huge in the future. Whether or not you know how it works, you're going to be able to use it and you're going to be on it. And I, I think where that's going to, part of where that's going to show up is transaction fees. I, in the 1970s, when they deregulated the brokerage firms, you had the low cost uh, brokerages come in and then more recently you had Robinhood come in and they were the first to do zero transaction fees and then everyone had to do it. Suddenly everyone had zero transaction fees. And I, I think it's something similar is going to happen with blockchain where it's having it's going to zero moment and it's going to be too late to turn around soon. So everyone's going to be on blockchain. And Zach? I am also bullish. Uh, you know, this the technology that's making these machines is getting better. The machines are getting more efficient. The blockchain itself is being altered, getting better. We're just, we're headed in the right direction. Excellent. Well, gentlemen, I want to thank you all for being in this first part of what we're calling the Wilson Economic Development uh, Midwest Futures Forum. Uh, again, we're talking about things that are, are progressive to Western North Dakota, including the state of North Dakota as a whole. Uh, they're going to have a big effect on us when we talk about economic development and going into the future. So I think it's important that the public understands a bit about what it is and, and what we're trying to do to attract it. But again, gentlemen, I thank you for your time and, and here's to the future of, of success in North Dakota. You're here. Hey, thanks for having us, Sean. Thank you. I want to thank you all for listening to the Midwest Futures Forum. This is brought to you by the City of Williston. Again, I'm Sean Wanko, Executive Director of the Economic Development Office. If you want to learn more or connect with us online, you can go to willistondevelopment.com. Thank you.